Okay, so our next talk is an industry talk from Sebastiano Sarkani. Right. You need to turn it on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. So, uh, so this is an interest, an industry talk. So we won't be as scientific. Uh, I am Sebastiano Saccani. I am a data scientist in this company called uh, Aindo, and we uh, we have the CISA logo because we are recognized as a CISA startup, and uh, we work, uh, um, yeah, on uh, applying essentially machine learning to the industry with a particular focus on generative model. So. So um, I used to be, say, one of you, so a researcher. I, I, I realized with disgust that this article was published 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, I was doing my PhD. And uh, in my PhD, I was using essentially Metropolis Hastings algorithm to sample a function of like this form that you, you may well recognize and that you have seen also in the previous, in the previous, previous talk. And um, right now, uh, moving to the industry, I still sampling probability distribution, sometimes of, of a very, very similar form. So uh, I'm going to try to give you a flavor of how we apply generative models into the industry. So what is a generative model? You may have seen this before, but a generative model is sim a, simply a model in machine learning that takes uh, a sample, samples from an unknown distribution, tries to learn that distribution, and is then uh, able to um, generate samples from that distribution. So this is a one-dimensional case, sorry, a one-dimensional case, like you have a 1D distribution, uh, you fit, say, uh, a distribution to it, a Gaussian, and then once you have the Gaussian, you, you can uh, resample, and so have new samples from the same distribution, the distribution that you have fitted. The, um, the characteristics of uh, uh, generative models in machine learning is that uh, the probability function that you are trying to, uh, to learn lives in a highly dimensional space. Uh, for example, the space of images, they have like if for one megapixel images, you have one million dimensions, so it's very highly dimensional. For the space of a smile string, uh, that's the same, it's a very high dimensional space. So you are trying to learn from samples on that distribution in very high dimensional spaces. And so you have this uh, magic process, say, in which through training, you, you have this box, uh, the generative model that uh, at will is able to generate new samples from that distribution that you learn, just like we've seen before, for example, with, uh, with molecules. So uh, a, a little bit of distinction. Um, Typically, uh, there are, we have two categories of models, the conditional and unconditional models. So in the unconditional models, we are trying to learn, uh, learn this distribution plain and simple, while in conditional models, we are trying to learn condition distribution. Okay, the name says it all. And um, a great example, say unconditional model is plain image generation uh, with the generative adversarial network, while uh, I would probably call what we've seen before with smile string uh, a conditional generation so we try to find the next token or the next word based the condition on the previous tokens and on the previous words and uh, the other things uh, that uh, that maybe it's an important distinction is uh, implicit versus explicit models um, there are some models um, in which we explicitly know the probability of uh, y so the probability, we can calculate the probability for a given configuration. For example, uh, in, in the autoregressive model, we can calculate the probability of the next token as we've seen in the previous talk. Uh, or, but there are also implicit models that are, I would say more common, but probably not. But anyway, quite common, which you cannot know explicitly your P of Y, but you are still able to sample from it. So let me give you a couple of examples so um, an unconditional and implicit model is, for example, a variation of encoder that you may know already. For those that, that you don't know how it works, um, it works as follows. So we have 
a, an input in which we receive samples from the distribution that I want to uh, reproduce. Um, these samples are encoded in uh, a reduced dimensionality space that's called a latent space. Actually, you encode each point into a distribution, but okay, that's a bit of a technical detail. And uh, then this, this encoding is typically done through uh, a neural function, so a neural network. And then you have another piece of code uh, that's also a neural network that takes the mappings in this latent space and maps those back into the uh, space of the original data. And you train this system through this uh, uh, kind of, uh, by minimizing the kind of losses, which essentially has two terms, a reconstruction term, um, which uh, forces the system to have a, a good uh, reproduction of the input data at in, in the output, and um, a Kullback-Leiber divergence term, which is uh, used in to force the, essentially, to force the distribution in the latent space to be simple. Why is that? Because in this way, we are able to map a complex distribution, that's the one, the one on the left, into a simpler distribution than I know, that is the latent space. And then I have a machinery to sample from that simple distribution back into the complex space that, I'm, that they started from. So in this way, uh, you can then at uh, inference time, once you've done the training, you essentially discard uh, the, the, the encoder part uh, and you just sample from this known distribution, which typically is a normal distribution, and uh, then apply your decoder and then you, you can generate new samples. Um, the other example that I want to show you, actually you have seen in the, previ uh, in the previous talk, so I will be very fast, autoregressive language models. So in this case, uh, I will not go through into the details. It uh, has already been discussed. People do it with the uh, recurrent neural networks. Uh, now they do it with the generative transformer. But anyway, the, the, the basics is still the same. Um, you have the previous tokens and you try to uh, predict the probability of the next token. And this allows you then to generate a piece of pieces, large pieces or small pieces of text, depending on your application, uh, because you have learned essentially from, uh, from a set of unlabeled data. So um, the other thing, so this is just a bit of an overview of, uh, say, types of generative models. Um, of course, we, we, went, we didn't go into the details, but the other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, the relation between self-supervision and generative models. You may have seen this blog post from Jan Lecan uh, or uh, collaborators, I don't remember exactly, uh, calling the self-supervision the dark matter of intelligence. Uh, so the self-supervision is uh, essentially, um, I would say a training procedure in which you uh, try to predict observed, observed, unobserved or hidden part of the input from observed or uh, um, things that you see of the input. So you slice your data in time or space. Uh, one part of the data is used for um, essentially as a prompt to the model and you're trying to predict what you don't see. So that's exactly what we were doing before. So uh, in, this, in these settings, we have something that part of the input that we see. So the pieces of strings we had before and there's something that's hidden inside, like the word here that we, that we want to predict. And so essentially we can say that most generative models, well, generative models are trained through self-supervision. And, um, and in fact, even unconditional generative models, you could say that are trained through self-supervision, but only in this case, uh, you do not have any observed part of the input. So the unconditional models like uh, the one, be, the one we had before. In this case, the generation is unconditioned and you can, we could still say that there are self-supervision model only that we don't have any observed part of the input. Uh, I probably made a bit of a mess of here, but I hope you, you follow me on that. And um, what, what this is, um, the self-supervision is uh, usually um, talked about uh, when we deal with the problem, the annotation problem in machine learning. If you are doing uh, su supervised uh, learning, um, the problem is that annotated data are expensive. Um, so we want to leverage data that are cheap 
uh, instead of leverage data that are expensive, side, uh, such as label data. So self-supervision is um, very often employed in this pre-training fine-tuned scheme that we also saw in the previous talk. So <laughs> my, my work is very easy today. Um, so we try to use lots of cheap data. Um, in the previous talk was uh, probably Campbell. Now uh, the lots of cheap data could be in this example, Wikipedia to train again, uh, um, um, start from a random, randomly initialized model. We obtained a pre-trained model and uh, with this um, pre-trained model, then I can do further fine tuning through um, using the supervised data that is my expensive data. And um, this can be done uh, just, uh, just as we've seen before with conditional model, but this can be also done with unconditional model because, um, for example, I take again my variational autoencoder here, say that I have a lot of unlabeled example, I can train an encoder that maps my complicated space uh, uh, into a reduced dimensionality space. So, um, because in, in the simpler space, so I can um, then use this encoder or just the representation of the data that I obtain to do a further classification task. And because now I live in a simple space, it's much easier. I need less data uh, to do that. So one of the big application of these self-supervised generative uh, models is actually pre-training uh, the models that you need uh, so that you don't need as many labeled data as you would. So that's one of the things we do all the times uh, with the very different models. So I didn't focus on, on, on any of that. Um, and the other things that I want to, to point out is, is that the industry is going through a uh, direction that's trying to substitute uh, unsupervised approaches to solve supervised problem. Um, I will give you one example of that. Um, for example, say that I have a translation task. This is generally considered a supervised problem in that I, I need to have Typically, they have parallel corpora. So the bodies of text in which on the left, say, you have uh, the language, the, 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 the starting language, which might be Italian. And on the right, you have the English translation. And you have to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between sentences so that you can do supervised training. These, are, these, of course, are hard to come about. This kind of data set are hard to obtain and need to be manually curated. So they are typically expensive. And what's been happening recently is that purely supervised approaches can uh, are sort of general, general learners, as they call it. So they can do multiple tasks. So for example, the, the classic case is GPT-3. GPT-3 is generative pre-trained model. So one of these models that can generate text as we've seen before. And uh, you can ask him, like you can prompt a sentence like that translate this into Italian, what rules do you have available? And, uh, and the model, we try to complete this sentence and uh, it tries to complete it in the correct way. So we actually outputted the translation. So quali sono le camere disponibili? So in this case, a model that's been trained completely unsupervised is doing a, a task that's seemingly supervised. This can be done for other tasks. Question answer is, is a big one for us because uh, uh, you, now you have models that are able to answer question or extract things from text uh, without being explicitly trained for doing that. So that's a big one for uh, somebody like us that works in the industry because this now relieves the burden of collecting the data or at least I can use now say 10 times less data than I would have to train a question answering model from, from scratch. So the last thing that I want to talk to you about is uh, probably the things that we are most focused on is the use of a generative model to create synthetic data. The, the, the bottom line is as follows. Um, in general, when you're working with the data, there is a problem of privacy, especially if you're talking about, uh, um, yeah, in the private sector, say a company, an insurance company needs to analyze the data. And there are always risks associated with it um, because of privacy and GDPR. So you want to protect the privacy of people, but you need, still, need be, still need to be able to analyze the data. And especially if you are um, dealing with uh, an external analysis provider like we are, 
um, giving your data to somebody else, it's risky. But in fact, when you're doing statistical analysis, as the name says, you're not really interested in the record level information. What you're actually interested in is the probability, uh, the statistics of your data set that described by this uh, probability function. So what we are trying to do is to say market uh, generative models uh, as a way to capture this probability function so that you can publish it. Um, but in doing that, you can publish this uh, function or you can publish it either directly or through a synthetic data set that is a resampling of this function that you have learned, this generative um, model essentially. And uh, in this way, you, don't, you haven't given any specific information about the people that were originally in the data set. That is, you have given them plausible deniability. So uh, even if I give you a synthetic data, you will not be able to recognize what are the people that were in the original data if the model is trained correctly. And, um, and or in, at least you are giving them plausible deniability. They can always deny that they were the, in the original data. Again, if the thing is done correctly. So we are using just this machinery that I've shown you before of generative models, but we are applying it to uh, the, the space of a typical corporate data set which are stored in tables. So now the, the, the question becomes more of training this uh, variational autoencoder or generative adversarial network or, or, or diffusion model, whatever, um, to a, a data set that uh, not really standardized. So it has different types of, say, um, columns, uh, which may be time, floats, uh, strings, uh, God knows what. And, uh, and you have to turn them into a smart way so that you can feed them into your uh, generative model and then you can sample out of that. So we had our own machinery, we have a, a library that does that. Um, and the other things that we are focusing on is extending this to a relational data set. Uh, the problem here becomes really messy because of the reason that we have on the right. So. Uh, when we are uh, synthesizing a single table with independent rows, everything is happy. But uh, when we have a, a rational data set, a lot of things break, a lot of assumption break. You have a one-to-many relation between uh, uh, samples. We have somehow uh, to carry the information across tables because a user is represented in this example here, a user is not represented by his features, but also what he does. So say this is an e-commerce uh, database what items uh, he has bought. Um, also, what is a sample here is not particularly clear. Rows might not be dependent on each other and so on and so on and so forth. So I will not go into the greedy details of what we do. Um, some of it, I would say, is also a bit of a trade secret. But uh, anyway, that's the direction we are going of using this kind of models to essentially publish this distribution, but uh, um, protecting the privacy of the people involved. So I'm the into a, the 18 minutes and I thank you for your uh, attention. And if you have any question and you're curious, or curious about what we do, feel free to ask. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for the insight into industry. Are there questions? And, ah, Kevin has one. So while I walk over to Kevin, I can maybe ask, do you have any clients from the industry that is maybe closer to engineering or, or material science at the moment? Sorry, I could uh... Do you have any clients that come from, say, the producing sector, uh, industries that- Well, actually, we manufacture... work uh, with, uh, with Kisi Pharmaceutici. So we actually do very similar things that we, we've seen in the, in the talk before. Um, and uh, we work with retail and banking. So these are the sectors that we work the most. Yeah, I was very fascinated by the parallelism and uh, the transferability of this, these methods. But I guess you answered my question whether also yeah, pharmaceutical companies or... Yeah, um, a big one for us now is using these, uh, uh, these language models for extracting information from text because it made it really, really simple to use this pre-trained model to extract information that you would have otherwise needed a lot of training data to do. So now I stupid stuff, yeah, really, but <laughs> kind of, kind of uh, 
a burden for needs, who needs to do it. Extracting information from invoice PDFs, for example, like uh, who has, uh, who has who, who's this invoice from? If you needed to do it uh, five years ago, you'd need a tons of trading data. Now we have this pre-trained model. You feed the text of the PDF and you ask them, uh, who is this invoice from? And you need a bit of fine tuning data, say a hundred samples, and you get out of a good performance out of it. So that's kind of amazing, I would say. Okay, any other questions? Anything on Zoom? Okay. Then in that case, let's thank our speaker again.